Good morning, everyone, and happy Palm Sunday. I know we're going to miss our tradition of having our children walk up and down the aisle, waving their palm branches as we all sing Hosanna to Jesus. But we're not able to do that this year. So I thought I'd give you the next best thing. Now, I know it's not the next best thing. I can never be as cute as our kids are. But I guess this is as cute as you can get. However, we are going to sing Hosanna to Jesus. So right where you are in your homes, standing or sitting, let's sing together our Hosanna to Jesus. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Exalted, O oh Lord my God, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, we lift up your name with our hearts full of praise. Be exalted, O oh Lord my God, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Let's together go to God's Word as we look at the story of the triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem, found in the book of Luke, chapter 19, starting with verse 28. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell him, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another, because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. When I was in seminary, we would usually have an end-of-the-year assembly. This was a program to close out the year and uh, just to enjoy each other's company before graduation, to say our goodbyes and to give out awards and so forth. And every year, some of the seniors would get up and they would do imitations of the professors. Now, mind you, the grades were already turned in at this point, and so they wouldn't have been so brave otherwise. One year, a guy went up front and he simply wrote something on the blackboard and he sat back down. He didn't say a word, 
but everybody knew who he was imitating by what he wrote on the blackboard. He just wrote the words, already, but not yet. This was the favorite phrase of one of the New Testament professors. It was his nutshell definition of the kingdom of God. He would refer to the teachings of the Bible about the kingdom of God as the already, but not yet. The Bible does teach a great deal about the kingdom, whether it's called the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Sometimes it's called the kingdom of Christ or often just the kingdom. Some scholars have tried to define a difference between these terms and other scholars say there is no difference, that these are just different ways of saying the same thing. And I'm not sure what to think about that. I think there may be some subtle differences between those terms. But for our purposes today, we're going to lump them all into one category and say that this definition accurately describes what the Bible calls the kingdom. It is the already, but not yet. Now, by the nature of that definition, it appears to be a rather complex concept. And I don't know that it's so much complex, but rather it is a very deep and profound thing. So deep and profound that the majority of Jesus' teachings over a time span of three to four years had to do with this subject of the kingdom. And scholars have then spent the next 2,000 years trying to interpret what Jesus taught about the kingdom. There's no possible way that I or anyone else could adequately explain the kingdom of God. But I would like to try to attach something to the subject matter that would help you to understand the kingdom in simplistic terms. This is what you might call a suitcase theology, meaning that it's something that you can put a handle on and that you can take with you and be able to share with others. Actually, this subject is far too heavy for anyone to grasp and to be able to just carry around with them. The already, but not yet. This is what we call a paradox, referring to opposite aspects of the same thing. The Bible is filled with paradoxes. It speaks of us being the strongest when we are weak, or of being the wisest when we have the foolishness of God, or of not being able to see until we become blind. These appear to be self-contradictions, but they are not. The Bible never contradicts itself. You will hear people say, oh, the Bible is just full of contradictions, and that's just not true. There is not one contradiction in the Bible. When something appears to be a contradiction, there's a reason for it. God did that on purpose, so that we will look more closely at the topic at hand and take the time and the effort to understand the truth that God has placed in front of us. One thing can have two sides or two aspects and still be one thing. In fact, some things require that there be more than one aspect in order for that thing to be complete and balanced. Many of you are wearing eyeglasses. You probably know that one side of your glasses is concave and the other side is convex. I forget which is which. I think it has to do with whether you're nearsighted or farsighted. But both sides are necessary for you to have eyeglasses. So are your glasses concave or are they convex? Well, the answer is that they are both. Or do you have a quarter in your pocket? Picture two people who have never seen a quarter trying to describe it to a blind person. One person picks it up and says, a quarter is a coin with a picture of an eagle sitting on an olive branch. The words United States of America and E Pluribus Unum are written across the top. And along the bottom, the words quarter dollar are written. Then the second person picks up that quarter and says, well, what are you talking about? I have a quarter here, and it has a picture of George Washington on it. It has the word liberty written across the top. And the words in God we trust written on the side. And then a date on the bottom. Well, the blind person will either be very confused, picturing George Washington with an eagle on his head and an olive branch in his mouth, or he understands that a coin, in order to be a coin, must have two sides, and that each person is simply describing opposite sides of the same coin. To study theology can be very confusing. Sometimes it seems like a tangled mess of ideas that don't have anything to do with each other. We must come to understand that some concepts, by necessity, have to have two sides in order to be balanced and complete. So one person could be describing the kingdom of God as something that is already here, and they would be absolutely correct. 
Another person could describe God's kingdom as something that has not yet happened, and they too would be absolutely correct. The trick, then, is to be able to picture it as a whole, as two sides of the same thing. So let's look this morning, then, at the kingdom of God in terms of something which is already, but still not yet. First of all, the biblical concept of a kingdom can be understood in three ways. A kingdom could be referring to the realm or the territory over which a monarch reigns. I picture a king standing on the balcony of his palace, looking over the land as far as the eye can see, and saying, this is my kingdom. It is the place. It's where I rule. Or a kingdom could be referring to the people over which a monarch reigns. I can picture that same king looking down at the people, walking along the streets, and saying, this is my kingdom. It's the people. It's who I rule over. Or another way that the word is used, not so much in English, but which is the primary meaning in Greek and Hebrew, is the actual rule itself. This is the way that a king rules, the amount of authority that he exercises, the integrity of his leadership, the response of the people to him. This is the actual purpose of the reign or the rule, not, not the land, not the people, but the purpose. All three of these usages can be applied to the kingdom of God. It is a place, it is a people, and it is a purpose. And in all three ways, we see how God's kingdom is something which is already in motion, and yet something that has not yet begun. First of all, the kingdom of God is the realm or the place in which it is experienced. The Bible says that it can be experienced here and now. Jesus is Lord now. God has absolute power and authority over everything now. He has made it possible so that anyone who trusts in him can enter into that kingdom and be a part of it right now. Jesus is king of all right now. However, the realm of his kingdom is not recognized today as it will be when he comes again. That which he has allowed Satan temporary access to will one day once again be his. And everything that God has ever created will be in the realm of his kingdom on that day. Secondly, people are a part of his kingdom now. Every member of the church at large is a part of his kingdom. And because of that, we are able to receive his blessings. We are able to know his joy. We are able to share his purpose now. Jesus said in Luke 17, 21, the kingdom of God is within you. However, in the future kingdom, the kingdom that is not yet, we will actually reign with Christ. We as his people are heirs to his throne. We are the kingdom already, but still not yet. And then thirdly, the purpose of the rule of Christ exists right now. He rules our hearts right now. All those who accept that rule and his authority now will be able to receive his blessings in the future. And so that rule of God in our hearts and in our lives is something that we are told that we are to seek above anything else. You all know Matthew 6.33 that says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Seek out the rule of God in your life. Make him your king. Desire to submit to his authority. And it will be the greatest joy of your life on this earth. Everything else will be taken care of if we would just do that. But at the same time, his rule is necessary to defeat our enemy and his enemy. And that is the purpose of his reign over us. To defeat Satan and to destroy sin and death. Look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting with verse 24. It says, Then the end will come, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. That is what the rule of Christ is all about. It is something that will not ultimately be done until after the millennial reign of Christ. Yet, Christ has already destroyed death and he has brought life through his death and resurrection. So his rule, his kingdom, is already, but it's still not yet. 
All right, from what we have said so far, let's see if we can come up with a broader definition of the kingdom of God besides just being already but not yet. So try this one on for size. The kingdom of God is the sovereign rule of God through Jesus Christ for the purpose of defeating his enemies, consisting of a people over whom he reigns and a realm in which to experience that reign. Let's say that one more time to get it through our heads. The kingdom of God is the sovereign rule of God through Jesus Christ for the purpose of defeating his enemies, consisting of a people over whom he reigns and a realm in which to experience that reign. That definition covers both the kingdom that is already and the one that is yet to come. There's his people, there's his territory or his place, and there's his rule or his purpose, which is to defeat his enemies. Now, if all this has been a little confusing, and I suspect that it has, let me put it in the most general of terms. Theologians might turn over in their graves at this, but for our purposes, may this be close enough. The kingdom of God, which is already here, is a spiritual kingdom. The kingdom of God that is not yet here will be a physical kingdom. Both are real, literal kingdoms, and both contain all the elements that we've discussed, a realm or a place, a people, and a purpose for that rule. When Jesus began his ministry on earth, this is when the spiritual kingdom began. In Matthew chapter 3, we read that John the Baptist announced the coming of Christ, and he said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It is here. The kingdom is here. The ministry of Jesus is summed up in Matthew 4.23, which says, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. We see all three components here, the place, the people, and the purpose. His rule was being established, and the purpose of that rule, to defeat his enemies, was being accomplished. See, the destruction of Satan really takes place in stages. Most of us realize that when Jesus died and he rose again, that sin and death were conquered, and that the destruction of Satan will be completed when Jesus returns. But few realize that the destruction of Satan began even before Jesus was crucified. In Matthew 12, we read that Jesus cast out demons from a man, and upon doing so, in verse 28, he said, The kingdom of God has come upon you. The defeat of Satan had begun, and Jesus' kingdom was established that moment when he showed his power and his authority over Satan. That is what the kingdom of God is all about, the defeat and the destruction of Satan the authority that we now have because of our faith in Jesus. And the spiritual warfare that we engage in shows us that we have power over our enemy because of our faith in Jesus. The people of the kingdom also had their beginning during the earthly life of Jesus. The disciples were commissioned by Jesus to do the work of the Lord. Seventy others were sent out by the authority of God over Satan. The kingdom of God was established 2,000 years ago, and he reigns today. The kingdom of God is already, and yet there's something more to come. An even greater kingdom awaits us. There are several instances in Scripture which show specific examples of how the kingdom of God is already, but not yet. First of all, I think of the transfiguration, that wonderful moment when Jesus took three of his disciples up on the mountain and he allowed them to see them in all his glory and majesty. What a picture of the kingdom that was. Jesus in a glorified body. Moses, there, and Elijah with him. Moses in a body that had been raised from the dead. Elijah in a body that had been raptured, that had been translated. And then Jesus in his glorified, transfigured body. The kingdom was right there. But still, it was not time for that revelation to be manifested to more than just a few. Only three disciples were able to see that. And it was a very temporary thing. It only lasted for a short while before Moses and Elijah were gone and Jesus was, was left there standing by himself. Peter wanted to build houses so that all of them could stay there and it could be a permanent expression of God's kingdom. But it was not yet time for that. And then there is surely no greater example in the Bible of how we are to understand the kingdom of God than the story that we read this morning and which we commemorate today of the triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. The multitudes just exploded in spontaneous, joyful praise to Jesus Christ, saying, Hosanna, which means God saves. They were openly acknowledging that Jesus was God and that salvation comes from Him. 
No power on earth could have stopped those praises from bursting forth. The kingdom of God was there right then. There was no disputing that. But still, there was something missing. We read that as Jesus saw the city, that he wept over it, painfully aware that they really didn't understand what his kingdom was all about, and grieving for the suffering that he knew his people would have to endure before his kingdom would be completed. That is precisely the scenario for today. Jesus is alive, and he is here, and he lives within us. And we have every reason in the world to just shout his praises and to joyfully celebrate every day of life that he has given to us. Jesus Christ is worthy to be praised. His kingdom is here and now. And what a privilege it is to be a part of it. Yet there can be no question that as God looks down over the world, that he weeps with pity over the spiritual blindness and he grieves for the suffering that the world will have to endure before the time comes when his kingdom will be total and complete. We know that God grieves for all those that are dying of this horrendous virus infecting the whole world. We know that God grieves for all of us who are infected with the virus of sin, and as a result of that, we are living in decaying and dying bodies. But we know that one day Satan will not only be defeated, but he will be destroyed, and God's rule will be unquestioned. And the people of God will not only be reigned by Christ, but they will reign with him. So God's kingdom, the one that is here already, as well as the one that is yet to come, is something that God has planned for his people, for those who have trusted in Christ as Savior. For if you have trusted Christ, that means that you have also been entrusted, entrusted with the work of the Lord to carry out his kingdom here on earth and forever in heaven. That kind of sheds a different light on the work that you do for the Lord through the church, doesn't it? You're not just fulfilling a, a responsibility or an obligation for an organization. You're not just trying to keep busy with things to do or helping out the preacher. You are carrying out the kingdom of God. Everything that we do as a church, all that we pray about is for that purpose. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Many don't understand that part of the Lord's Prayer. It is the goal of the church to build God's kingdom on this earth, the kingdom that is already, as well as it is in heaven, the kingdom that is yet to be. It is a privilege, it is a responsibility, and it is an inheritance for those who have trusted Christ as Savior. If there is anyone here who has not done that, I want you to think about something. A number of years ago, there was a television commercial for a car oil filter. You might remember it, the mechanic would say, you can pay me now or you can pay me later, referring to the fact that if you bought an oil filter now, you wouldn't have to pay more later. I think at the time it was $4 for an oil filter and $600 for a ring job that he would have to pay for later. I looked up today, now the oil filters cost about 15 bucks and you can't get a ring job for less than $1,800. So you get the picture. You can pay now or you can pay a lot more later. Let me tell you that Jesus Christ is King and nothing or nobody can change that fact. If we don't proclaim it, Jesus said the rocks and the stones would do that. You can either acknowledge that now and be a part of that great kingdom, or you can acknowledge it later when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But if you wait until then, it will be too late to be saved and you will be banished from his kingdom. You can decide now or you can decide later. It's up to you. We don't know how long from now that the kingdom that is yet to be will be established. It may not be long at all. But we can be assured of entering that kingdom when we become children of the king by letting Jesus into our lives. If you are not sure whether you are part of God's kingdom or not, you can be sure today. If you have any questions about that, I ask you that you give me a call and we'll help you with that. If you are a member of God's kingdom, then together we are going to share in the Lord's table Always something that we do here on the first Sunday of every month, and we're not able to do that together. But we are going to be able to do that uh, online. So bear with us as we get ready for that. If you have prepared with us for this moment, I'd like you to take the piece of bread or a piece of cracker that you have, and also a cup of juice. If you have not done that, would you just push pause on your device and take time to do that now, and then we'll join together. As you take the piece of bread in your hand, I'd like to read from Scripture. 
It says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As you have that piece of bread in your hand, I'd like you to take time now just to pray and to thank God for what he's done for you, to acknowledge the price that was paid so that your sins can be forgiven. Push the pause button and take time to, to pray, and then when you're done, push play again. Jesus said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat. Now I ask you to take your cup of juice as I again read from some scripture. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. Again, as you hold the cup of juice in your hand, I'd ask you to take some time just to pray, to confess your sins to the Lord, to take time to be right with Him. And after you've said that prayer, go ahead and put the, the pause button and then put the play button when you're ready. Jesus said, This cup which has been poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Drink all of it. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. May the fellowship of our kindred minds be like to that above. God be with you till we meet again.